And uh, just again, for anybody joining us, we are recording this. Um, we do have pre-recorded uh, you know, prior versions of this up on our website already, and um, we'll probably put this recording up as well once it's ready. So with that, I'll uh, go ahead and get into this. So for our overview, first of all, we'll talk about SEC and IIC, just the basics. What are they? What are the differences? Probably old information for many of you, but just make sure we're clear on the basics. Then we'll talk about the difference some of the basic differences between lab and field measurements and the different metrics that are used for field measurements versus lab measurements. Uh, and then we'll cover a few myths and misconceptions about SDC and IIC ratings, just things I've come across over the years that I think are useful to touch on. Um, and then we're going to get deeper into this. We're going to talk about actually reading SDC and IIC graphs. And that, I think, helps better inform our conversation about these ratings, what they do and don't tell us, um, which is kind of really the gist, the, like a big part of this this presentation. Um, and hopefully just having this understanding, like I don't expect everybody here, you know, if you're not an acoustician to be able to go calculate these ratings and do this detailed analysis, but hopefully kind of like, you know, looking under the hood of these will help you better understand where they come from and kind of how they apply to your projects. So in that vein, we'll talk about how the SDC and ISC ratings are calculated. And that will lead us to a discussion of some of the shortcomings of the SDC and IIC ratings and how those might impact your projects. And um, in part to address some of those shortcomings of the IIC ratings, we have these two new standards, the HIIC and LIC. So we'll talk about those, what they are, um, what they tell us, why they're helpful. And then last but not least, we'll talk about methods of improvement and we'll use all of these sort of ratings of what we've talked about to evaluate some different sort of typical methods for improving the performance of you know, uh, assemblies used for sound isolation. So with that, we'll go ahead and get into this. Um, so first off, I want to start with this quote. I use this quote a lot. Um, and it's with the current level of performance specified by the building code, a large percentage of people are highly annoyed by noises from their neighbors, leading to a reduced quality of life and possibly to negative health effects. Um, so a couple things from this is one that like noise isn't just sort of a an annoyance issue. It really is a health issue. Noise is an environmental pollutant that can have some very serious health effects. Primarily, it just increases stress, and then you have all of the knock-on effects that come from increased stress, you know, cardiovascular issues and things like this, right? Um, and so we have code requirements and things like that um, to help provide some level of, you know, security, some level of wellness or whatever, right, in our places that we inhabit. Um, but typically, codes are given in terms of minimums, and that's the case for SDC and IIC ratings, like in the building code for multifamily housing, right? Those SDC and IIC ratings are minimums, and just achieving the minimum doesn't mean that everybody's going to be satisfied, or even everybody's going to, you know, have a space that's quiet enough for them to really, like, be healthy. And this actually comes from, this quote comes from the International Code Council itself, the Code Council that also puts forth the minimums that they're saying aren't sufficient. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, and this quote specifically comes from the ICC G2 2010 Guidelines for Acoustics. And it's a document put together by uh, a number of different, you know, leading acousticians in the industry. And there's a lot of good information in there. It can be a good you know, sort of general design resource, and I'd encourage everyone to go check it out if you're not familiar with it. All right, so with that, we'll kind of get into this. So SDC and IIC, what's the difference, right? You may already know this, but I, I still hear them mixed up a fair bit, so let's go over the basics. So SDC stands for sound transmission class, and it measures the reduction of airborne sound, and will differentiate between sort of airborne and structure-borne or like impact sound. And really where we draw the distinction is sort of where or how the sound originates. So an airborne sound, we're talking about noise sources like people talking, TVs, stereos. So the sound really sort of originates with something moving the air and then that sound propagates through the air. Whereas structure borne or impact sound, sound sort of originates with an interaction with the structure. So footsteps would be the primary example of that. We'll get to others in just a minute. 
So the STC, or sound, sound transmission class, applies to walls and floor ceiling assemblies. And the way it's measured, you can see the basic diagram over here. So we have in the source room, we have a noise source, typically a speaker or a couple speakers, and they play um, pink noise, basically sounds like TV radio static. And um, so we actually measure, there should be a microphone in here. We measure how loud it is in the source room where the speakers are. And then we measure how loud it is in the receiving room. So either on the other side of the wall or you know the other side of the floor ceiling assembly. We measure how loud it is. And essentially you take the difference between the levels in the source and the received rooms. And um, you do some math calculations, which we'll show later, and you get an STC rating. IIC stands for impact insulation class, and it measures the reduction of structure borne sound. Like I said, structure borne sound really originates an in interaction with the structure. So footsteps could be a great example of that, but it could be dragged chairs, dropped objects. Um, we can also think about structure so borne sound in terms of some piece of mechanical equipment that's mounted to the structure that's vibrating, right? But that's not what we're dealing with with the IIC. So the IIC, um, applies to floor ceiling assemblies only, and it's really sort of designed around footsteps. So it's not necessarily going to give you an indication of a, an assembly's performance for reducing noise from, you know, mechanical equipment, but it's also not indicative of performance for heavy dropped objects like um, free weights in a gym. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more of that in just a second. So the way we measure an IIC rating is we use a standardized impact source. So it's called the tapping machine. It's got these five little weights. Um, they're 500 grams, so half a kilogram, which is, I don't know what that is in pounds. It's about a pound or something like that, I think. Um, and they're dropped from, I think, about a, an inch and a half, maybe a little bit more. So it's not a very hard impact, right? Um, but you've got five of these. They're operated on like a cam or with electromagnets and they get impacted. So just tap, 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 tap on the floor. And you just measure how loud it is down below. And then you do some calculations and you get an IIC number. Um, and for both of these, the SDC and the IIC, the higher the number, the better, right? Um, so a higher SDC number means you're reducing the sound from one side to the other more. There's more reduction of sound or noise. Um, an IIC, higher IIC rating means it's quieter in the space below when you're banging on the floor up above. Okay. So laboratory versus field. So we have laboratory measurements, right, which is a controlled environment, and we have field measurements, which is we go out to some existing building, you know, that's, and we, we do a test there, right, in the field. Um, in the lab, the measurements that we get um, for airborne sound, we have an STC, that's our rating, our lab rating, and for impact sound or structure borne, we have an IIC. And the big thing about labs is that we go to great lengths to control and try to eliminate flanking paths. So a flanking path is any way that the sound can sort of get around or flank the assembly that we're trying to test. So the intent, the idea is that in a laboratory test, we're only measuring the sound that's going directly through the assembly we're testing. Now there are still, this is the real world, there are still limitations even to the amount of isolation that we can get in the lab, but that's the goal is that we're just measuring this assembly we're testing. And therefore the results should be indicative of the performance of that assembly independent of the surrounding sort of independent of its context. That's the idea. In the field is a little different, right? Um, so first we have different ratings, different nomenclature to designate that it is a field test versus a lab test. So for airborne sound, we have three different potential metrics, the ASTC, NNIC, and NIC. And for impact sound, we have the AIIC, NISR, and ISR. Um, now, some of you um, may have also seen FSTC and FIIC, those ratings really no longer exist. They're in older versions of the standard. They've gone away. Um, there's, so there's three different metrics, both for airborne and three for impact sound. And really the differences between those um, really has to do with your site conditions, room sizes, 
amount of absorption in the spaces, things like that. So it's sort of nuanced differences. Essentially, the tests are the same, and it's about the same way we do it in the lab, right? So for airborne sound, we've got some speakers, make some noise, measure how loud it is on both sides. For impact sound, we have a tapping machine, bang on the floor, measure how loud it is down below. But the difference in the field is that the flanking paths are included in the measurements. Right, so we're measuring the sound that's coming through all these different paths. So we have the direct path, which is what we were measuring in the lab. Um, but in the real world, all of these things are sort of connected to each other in the structure of the building that we're measuring. So we have other ways that the sound can be transmitted from one space to the other. Right, and a couple examples here from these yellow lines. So what this means is that when we do a field test, the results we get indicate the performance of the assembly and the surrounding structure. So it is context dependent. And what this means also is that the results are only applicable to that specific tested assembly and not just like that building, but that room in that building. Because if you go somewhere else in that building, you may have different circumstances, right? Like for an apartment building, one apartment might be sort of in the middle of your floor plate and it's just, you know, a corridor and other units adjacent to it. But if you go to a building at or a, a unit maybe at one end of that building, maybe it's near um, a stair or an elevator. And so there's a shaft wall that runs continuously down, right? That might transmit sound from one floor to the next, right? So you have these different sort of contexts that can affect your results. Um, so that's a limitation of, of field tests, which is why as a manufacturer, you know, we tend to try and laboratory tests because it's more independent of the sort of broader context of the assembly. So code requirements, and these are for multifamily, right? So apartments, condominiums, things like that. So for airborne sound, um, the lab uh, minimum is 50, so SDC 50, and the field is 45. For structure borne sound, again, the lab is 50, so IIC 50, and the field, it's 45. Those are the minimums required by the building code. Um, for the field ratings, prior code versions didn't actually specify which metric you were supposed to use. The latest version of the code specifies, and so for field, for airborne sound, I believe it specifies NNIC, and for structure borne sound or impact sound, it specifies the NISR. I think that's, that's correct. Um, so, Ratings, myths, and misconceptions. Here's just a few that we'll we'll touch on. So the first one is you can add SDC ratings. So wouldn't it be nice if we can just get have an SDC rating for you know sort of different elements that go into a floor ceiling assembly, and then we can just add them together to see what the composite is. So here's here's one example of that. Um, so this is a two by ten wood joist floor assembly. This is uh, actual lab results from the National Research Council of Canada, a big report that they have out. Um, so this is two by 10, some bad insulation in the cavities, a single layer of subfloor plywood or OSB, I can't remember which, um, but the joist cavity is exposed underneath. And this got an SEC 24. And then similar sort of thing, but for the ceiling. So we have just the ceiling layer, the joist cavity is exposed up above. We have two by 10 joists, resilient channel, and a single layer of chip and we get an SDC 27. So can we just add the two together and say that, you know, if you have the subfloor and the ceiling together in this assembly, you get an SDC 51, you've met your code minimum, all's well and good. Well, it turns out when NRC went and actually tested this, they got an SDC 49. Now, it's only a two point difference, right? Which is small, but in this case, it makes the difference between an assembly that meets code and doesn't. So if you just added the SDC ratings, you'd be like, oh yeah, this meets code. But if you actually go test the thing, it doesn't. That could be an issue, right? Um, a more egregious example that I should probably edit in here um, is uh, a wall, right? So if we take a typical, like say a two by four wood stud wall, studs 16 inches on center, and we have a layer of gypsum board attached directly to the studs on both sides. Uh, maybe some bad insulation of the cavity. That's probably in the realm of like STC 36, something like that. 
But let's say we've got one of those walls and then we stick another one next to it, but we leave an airspace in between. We've got an inch in between them. So we have these two STC 36 walls next to each other. Can we add the STC ratings and get an STC 72 wall? Um, no, not at all. If you actually go test that, it's something more probably around like STC 46 or 50, something like that. Um, so far below just adding the STC ratings. Um, and the reason for this is that when we do an STC test or an IIC test, right, we're measuring the sound that's being transmitted through this structure. And that depends on the way all of those different elements interact with each other. Um, and so, you know, each independent component is going to perform differently depending on the context, right? It's just like, you know, Usain Bolt is super fast, right? And he's got some fancy shoes that help him go faster, right? But if I take his shoes and put them on, I'm not going to be as fast as him, right? Because I'm just slow. So the how fast those shoes are depends on the context of who's wearing them, right? The same way, same thing is true for these uh, acoustic assemblies, right? How well they perform depends on how the parts go together. Uh, so in a similar vein, um, this idea the misconception that you can add a delta IIC to any assembly. So first off, what is a delta IIC? So if you remember at IIC, you got a tapping machine, you bang on the floor, you measure how loud it is down below, do some calculations, you get your IIC rating. The delta IIC is the delta or the, the change in an IIC rating. And it's specifically measured always on a concrete slab. And typically it's measured on a six inch concrete slab. And the way you do it is you tap on the bare six inch concrete slab um, and you measure how loud that is. You get an ISC rating for it. And then you put some flooring and underlayment or whatever on top of that slab. You tap on it again, measure how loud it is, get an ISC rating. And basically you take the difference, right? So the delta ISC is the improvement of the ISC rating for a concrete slab. So here we have um, uh, floor and underlayment. I think this is engineered wood on the recycled rubber underlayment, and we got a delta IIC of 24 for that. So can we take that and apply it to some other assembly? Here we have a very robust open web truss. It's got gypsum concrete on an underlayment, um, and then resilient um, clips for the ceiling and two layers of gypsum board. So this already performs well. It's an IIC 62, but it's just a uh, bare gypsum concrete. So if we put the finished floor and underlayment on it, can we add the delta IIC to the IIC and get an IIC of 86? That would be awesome because that's a really high number. But unfortunately, when we go test this assembly, it's an IIC 68. Still a great rating, a very high IIC rating, but not anywhere near as high as IIC 86. And again here, um, what we're looking at with these is how all of the elements go together. And the way of flooring and underlayment interacts with a big, heavy concrete slab is totally different from sort of the way that it interacts with a lightweight structure like an open web truss. Um, so you can apply a delta IIC to a six inch concrete slab, and you can apply it to you know seven or eight inch concrete slabs, and you can fairly effectively apply it to you know, concrete composite metal deck assemblies. Um, but you can't, it does not, as you see here, really work for um, lightweight joist structures. All right, so the last thing is this idea that acoustical products have their own FTC or IIC ratings. And this is kind of the same thing, like the analogy with the shoes, running shoes, right? It's just being like, these running shoes make you this fast regardless of who's wearing them that's not the case right and an acoustical product um, doesn't make an assembly perform the same regardless of what assembly it's in so as an example of that here we have two walls um, all the elements the basic building blocks of these are the same we have two by four wood studs we have bad insulation we have sound isolation clips and gypsum board the only difference is that the wall on the right has two layers of gypsum board on each side instead of one but we get a six point difference in the STC rating, right? So we can't say that any one element in the system has an STC rating of X because if we combine the pieces differently, we get different results. Um, that makes things more complicated. That means that um, we can't just, you know, sort of 
build these assemblies together fairly easily based on STC ratings and say, oh, well, if we change this and this assembly, then it gave us three points, it'll do the same thing in this assembly. It's more complicated than that. And we'll get into that when we go into like reading these graphs and how the calculations are done. Kind of touch on that. So with that, um, here we go into some of the more sort of detailed stuff. Um, and again, my intent here is not to teach everybody this to the point where you could go calculate your own STC and ISC ratings. Again, it's to sort of look under the hood, help you understand a little bit better about what's going on, where these ratings come from, to help understand um, how they apply and some of their limitations. So if you've ever looked at an STC or an IIC like test report, either a, a field or a lab report, um, you should have seen the graph, something like this one on the right. And these graphs give us details of the assembly's performance beyond the overall like single number STC and IIC ratings. If you're looking at a graph for an IIC test, um, what the graph will show you is the ISPL in decibels. ISPL stands for impact sound pressure level. And that's just how loud are the impacts in the space below. If you're looking at a graph for an STC test, you'll see the TL in decibels. And TL stands for transmission loss. And that's basically how much does the assembly reduce the noise levels from one side of the wall or floor ceiling assembly, one side of the partition to the other. Right? And both of those are measured in decibels, which is our standard metric for measuring sound levels. Um, on this graph, on the X axis or the horizontal axis, we have frequency in Hertz. And it goes from low numbers, which are low frequencies on the left. Um, and you can think of example, like a uh, upright bass, bass guitar, right? Low frequencies. And then on the right, we have high numbers, which are high frequencies. So you can think of like a violin or piccolo, something like that. Um, alternative examples for low frequencies, we can think of like that low frequency rumble of a big like diesel freight train, right? Or for high frequencies, we can think of that like high pierce, high like piercing screech squeal of a fire alarm or, um, you know, like the beeper on your, you know, your microwave or your oven or something like that, right? It's this high pitched sound. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, as I was putting this together, I found some standard that says like fire alarms, their frequency, uh, at least some instances at least, is 3,150 hertz, which happens to be the upper frequency uh, for the IIC range for context. Um, so you can think of each one of these different frequencies, or really it's frequency bands, but you can think of these different frequencies sort of like keys on a piano, right? So each key on a piano plays a different note, and that different note has a, a different fundamental frequency. Um, so when we look at this, we see this graph, it's kind of telling us like how loud are we hitting each of those keys on a piano? If we just press all of our hands down on the, the keyboard, you know, we're gonna hit some keys louder than others. And that's kind of what we're looking at, right? Um, and bonus points to anybody here, you throw it in the chat or say it at the end, uh, uh, if you can identify the issue with this piano. Okay, so we do our test, um, we get some speakers, we make, make a bunch of noise, we measure how loud it is on that side, we measure how loud it is on the other side, we take the difference, we get our transmission loss values. How then do we get from that to an STC rating? Or we've done our IIC test, we bang on the floor above, measure how loud it is down below, we get our ISPL values. How do you get a single number rating from all of that information? And the way we do it is what's illustrated here, so these two animations, um, we call it a curve fit. So on both of these graphs, um, STC on the right, IIC on the left, sorry, STC on the left, IIC on the right, you'll see a gray line with some dots. That represents the measured values. So for STC, TL, transmission loss, IIC, ISPL, impact sound pressure level. So measure how loud it is at each one of those frequencies or for the ISC or for STC, what, what the noise reduction was, right? Um, and so then you'll see these, this orange line and that's our standard curve. It's dictated within the ASTM standard for these measurements. Um, and so what we do is we, sh uh, for the STC calculation, you'll see that we shift that line up. So it represents uh, higher and higher STC ratings as we move the line up. Um, right, because higher STC ratings mean 
more noise reduction. Um, and so anywhere where that orange line is above the gray line, is above the measured values, we call it a deficiency. Now that doesn't mean that the wall is actually deficient there, it just means that curve is above the measured value. So you can see as we shift that curve up, you see the little uh, yellow bars at the bottom increasing. And the standard, the ASTM standards for these say that um, the total number of deficiencies can't be more than 32, and the deficiency at any one frequency can't be more than eight. And so you'll see we increase this, we move the curve up until you know one of the the sum of the deficiencies or the max deficiency gets flagged, and then we bump it down one, and that's our rating. Okay, IIC rating is very similar. Except if you think about it, for an IIC, we're measuring how loud is it in the space below. So lower levels mean quieter, right? So if we shift the curve down, that represents higher IIC ratings because it's quieter in the space below. So in this case, if lower is better, then a deficiency is anywhere where the uh, gray line is above that curve, so where it's louder, right? And again, doesn't mean that it's actually deficient, it's just, you know, the measured level is above, above this curve. And we have the same stipulations here. So the total deficiencies can't exceed 32. The max deficiency at any frequency can't exceed 8. And that's how we get our ratings. But you could see how you know, these lines, the shape of these lines maybe could change. Like maybe you could have these deficiencies at lower frequencies or maybe at higher frequencies. And that's um, especially true for the IIC ratings. For SDC, we tend to see this the curve, the line goes up from low frequencies to higher frequencies. We get more noise reduction or TL at higher frequencies. IIC ones, you can see a lot more variation in the shape of those curves, and I'll I'll show that in a little bit. A lot of times when I've um, shown people these graphs over the years, um, you know, if if they're not in acoustics and um, Maybe not musicians also, maybe the piano reference doesn't help that much. Um, some people have expressed having a hard time understanding how you have like all of those different frequencies occurring at the same time. Um, so to try and help explain that, I'll throw something else at you that's also complicated. But I th think if you go play around with this, it can be a helpful way for understanding sound, frequency, level, all of these things that we're talking about. So what you see here on the screen is a spectrogram. Um, and you can think of it a lot like sort of a thermal heat map, right? So if you've got like a thermal camera, you're looking at a building envelope, um, you see red is areas where more heat's coming through, you know, blue or black or some of these sort of cool colors are areas where it's colder, right? So you can see these differences in temperature. Um, a spectrogram tells us something similar, but it tells us differences in how loud things are. Um, and how loud they are at different frequencies. So on this, again, we have a piano keyboard. This one's drawn correctly. Um, so we have lower frequencies to the left and higher frequencies to the right, just like our horizontal or x-axis on our graphs for the SDC and IIC calculators. And here you can see two examples. So this, this little green area further to the right, higher frequencies, was me, I think, ta tapping like uh, the pencil lead on my desk. Right, so it's this narrow sort of higher frequency clicking range, right? And then over here we see a bunch of like red and yellows and things and orange, so it's louder. And it's all further to the left, so it's lower frequencies. And I think this is me like pounding my fist on the desk. So you can think of the difference in these sounds, right? The click of a pencil lead on a desk versus like the thud and thump of a fist on the desk. Um, there's a link down at the bottom. Um, if you go to that, the AM Acoustics Analyzer, um, it's just a cool tool and you can play around with it, use your microphone on your computer or whatever, and you'll see this, uh, the spectrogram change in real time. And so you can kind of get an idea of frequency and level and this kind of stuff. I think it's helpful for understanding sound. All that, now we're going to get into talking about the shortcomings of these ratings. So SDC rating has been around for many, many decades. Um, I think it, you know, came about some of the similar guys to still what we have now back in maybe like the 50s or the 60s, the, the actual ASTM standard came out. 
And it was designed around speech. And if you think back, like at those times, um, it was less common for people to have, you know, stereos that could produce a lot of bass, right? Or home theater systems, you know, a big 7.1 channel home theater system with a subwoofer and stuff like that, right? Um, I mean, today, even just the little like sound bars or portable, like, you know, Bluetooth speakers and things like that can produce a fair bit of sound at fairly low frequencies. Um, so that's become very prevalent um, and more of an issue maybe in the built environment. But uh, originally, the STC rating was really just designed around speech. So because of that, and other reasons as well, but um, part because of that, the STC rating has a limited frequency range. Um, because our speech frequencies have a limited frequency range, um, and it's also just harder to measure low frequencies especially. So the range of frequencies that's used for the SDC calculation goes from 125 hertz to 4,000 hertz. And actually, these are sort of the like the centers of third octave bands. So the range actually goes a little bit further than that. But for all intents and purposes, that's sort of the range that we're looking at. But here's the range that we can hear, right? So this is what we measure and use to calculate an SDC rating. But here's what we can hear. So we can hear frequencies that go far above what we look at for the SDC rating and also far below what we look at for the SDC rating. And as I said previously, the, the line, you see that gray line, right? It tends to slope up from left to right. So from low frequency to high frequency. So, and that's pretty common for these graphs for airborne sound isolation. So if our wall or floor ceiling assembly or window door, whatever it is, provides enough isolation at 4,000 Hertz, it's probably gonna provide enough isolation at higher frequencies because it's gonna typically provide more isolation, more noise reduction, right? However, on the other end, if you look at 125 Hertz on the left end of the orange line, right, you'll see that the gray line keeps going down below that as we move to the left. So if we have enough noise reduction or TL at 125 Hertz, we might not at 100 or 80 or 63 Hertz, right? And Below 125 hertz is where all those base frequencies, those low frequencies that come from subwoofers and things like that. That's where all of that exists. Um, and with the STC rating, we're not looking at any of that at all. So if you're designing a movie theater, that's going to have big subwoofers in it or the walls for a spin class that's going to have big powered speakers and a subwoofer oftentimes. Um, the STC ratings that maybe you're specifying they don't address that low frequency noise at all. And usually that's the biggest issue. Like if you think about going to the movies and there's a movie playing in the theater next to you, what do you hear? You don't hear the like high pitched like screams and shattering glass. You hear the thumps and thuds of explosions and things like that, right? That um, limited frequency range is um, a significant shortcoming, especially depending on the kind of project that we're doing and the kind of noise that we're trying to address. Um, and a single number doesn't really tell the whole story, right? So it doesn't tell us about all the different frequencies. And if we have some noise source that maybe produces a specific frequency, like maybe it's some beeping alarm or something like that, right? That has just a high frequency. We might have dips at that high frequency um, that we don't necessarily know about with just a single number SDC rating. And again, as we started out, code minimum does not guarantee satisfaction. Um, and that's the case for, you know, multifamily code, but we also have acoustical requirements for, for classrooms and hospitals and, and all of these hotels and all of these different things, right? And for all of those, just because we achieve the minimum doesn't mean that it's going to be sufficient for that particular space, that particular context, and the expectations of the users, inhabitants of that space. Shortcomings for the IIC. So the ISC, I think, has even more significant shortcomings than the STC rating. Um, the ISC rating was designed around footsteps, and that's still primarily where we use it. Um, although these days, with the you know continually increasing prevalence of fitness facilities, um, we see a lot of issues with impacts from heavy weights. You know, dropped dumbbells, barbells, kettlebells, all these kinds of things, right? Um, 
And I've seen the IIC rating used to specify flooring and assemblies in those places, but the IIC rating really is not applicable to those because again, we're dropping these little bitty, like basically like one pound weights from an inch and a half, right? We're not hitting the floor that hard for an IIC test. It was designed around footsteps, but again, it has a limited frequency range. Um, so it goes from 100 hertz to 3,150 hertz. So slightly shifted from the STC rating, but about the same range. And again, here's what we can actually hear. Um, and again, the single number doesn't tell the whole story. So like I said, with the, the STC, with those graphs, the line tends to trend up from low frequencies to higher frequencies. Um, IICs, we tend to see things trend down from low frequencies to high frequencies. So it tends to be louder at low frequencies than at high frequencies. But we can see a lot of different shapes of curves. And there are some assemblies like a bare concrete slab where it's actually louder at high frequencies than it is at low frequencies. So we see a lot more variation in these, but a single number doesn't tell us that. Again, also, we have this limited frequency range. And um, that's most problematic at low frequencies, as with STC. So if you see the gray line here, as we go to the left beyond that orange line, we see that the impact sound pressure levels go up, they get louder. So if our impact levels were okay at 100 hertz, they might still not be okay at 80 or 63 at those lower frequencies. And those lower frequencies are really important. Those are the thuds and the thumps and the booms that are often the issues for impact sound. And again, code minimum does not guarantee satisfaction. And in part, that's because it ignores those low frequency thumps and thuds. And here's a great example of that. Um, so this is a from a there was a paper by Blazier and Dupree. It was published in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America in 1994. And it's an often referenced um, paper when us in the industry are talking about IIC ratings and their shortcomings and all of that stuff. And this paper focuses on a large luxury condominium building in the San Francisco area. And there is an $80 million class action lawsuit brought against the developers. And you know, keep in mind that's $80 million in like early 90s, maybe late 80s money. So a lot more today. And a major claim within this suit was annoyance from excessive noise and vibration due to footsteps. And a lot of times when we're thinking about um, buildings and getting the IIC ratings that we need, um, we'll think, hey, if, if we've got carpet and pad, we're going to get these really high IIC ratings. Um, and we'll be totally fine if we've got carpet and pad. It's when we're going to, you know, resilient flooring, hard surface flooring that we need to be more careful, maybe need to build some extra sound isolation into our assemblies. But that's not necessarily the case because, again, our IIC ratings, those high IIC ratings that we see with carpet and pad, they ignore the low frequency stuff. And in this particular instance for Blazier and Dupree, um, that played out. Um, complaints were coming from areas without carpet, as you might expect, but also areas with carpet. And the complaints really focused around thuds, thumps, and booming. And here's a really good quote from this paper. So the IIC rating of a floor system is meaningless with respect to the perception of these low frequency components of footfall noise because the methodology ignores the frequency spectrum below 100 hertz. So in essence, there's important information, there's sound happening, there's stuff happening below 100 hertz that affects our perception of the space, right? But it's ignored by the IIC rating. And I've talked about how the shape of the curve can vary, right? So here we see a graph again. We've got frequency on the horizontal axis, impact sound pressure level on the vertical axis. And each colored line here on the graph represents the results for a different tested floor ceiling assembly. Every single one of those is an IIC 55. So they all have the same rating, but if you look at them, they're all totally different shapes. There's quite a bit of variation there. And different shapes basically mean different sounds. And so here we have highlighted the actual range for the IIC rating, and we still see a bunch of variation within that range. And if we look at the lower frequencies, um, the lowest frequency, 100 hertz, right? The minimum impact sound pressure level measured for these assemblies was a 52, and the maximum was 65 dB at 100 hertz. 
for reference, a 10 dB increase in sound level is a doubling in perceived loudness. So at 100 hertz at this low frequency, the quietest assembly here, or sorry, well, let's put it this way, the loudest assembly here was more than twice as loud as the quietest assembly. That's a significant difference, right? But they still get the same rating. Now, if we look at the high frequencies, right, the upper end of the IIC range, 3,150 hertz, our minimum value measured was 5 dB, just a little bit above the threshold of hearing. And our maximum was 45 dB. That's pretty significant. So that's a 40 dB change. That's like 16 times louder in terms of perceived loudness. I'm not sure that rule of thumb even stretches out that far, but there's a huge difference here, right? And so if you think about this, all of these assemblies have the same IIC rating. So on paper, if we're just looking at the IIC rating, they all look like they perform the same and that our perception, our experience of them, if we're living in the unit below or staying in the hotel room below, right? We might think that our experience is going to be the same. But if you look at the differences in the levels at specific frequencies and the different shapes of these, that's not necessarily going to be the case. So that brings us to these new ratings, HIIC and LIIC. So what are these? So HIIC stands for High Frequency Impact Insulation Class. There's the ASTM standard number. And it really deals with the clicks and clacks from impacts. And it looks at this range from 400 to 3,150 hertz. And you think about the clicks and clacks is like the sound of, you know, hard soled uh, like business dress shoes or high heels on like a hard surface floor, right? That higher click and clack. Um, LIIC stands for low frequency impact insulation class. There's the ASTM number, and it deals with those thuds and thumps that Blazier and Dupree were said were so important. But it's outside this orange line, right? The typical range that we measure for an IIC rating. It's looking at those lower frequencies that Blazier and Dupree said were a big issue, but were ignored by the IIC rating. So HIIC, if you see here that highlighted area is all within the bounds of the orange line. So it's all frequencies that we're already measuring for an IIC test. So that means it's easily measured as part of an IIC test. And you can also go back to a previously done IIC test before the HIIC standard exists. You can take the measurement data and you can calculate an HIIC. What is an HIIC useful for? Well, it um, it's really helpful for evaluating flooring and underlayments. Um, you might be thinking, well, if it's everything we're getting for the HIIC is within this frequency range that we get for an IIC, what new information is it telling us? So the folks um, that really developed the HIIC and LIIC ratings, consultants at Vina Clausen and Associates, um, they found in all of their testing that they've done that flooring and underlayments, their effects on impact sound tend to be limited to this range from 400 to 3,150 hertz. There are some exceptions to that, more robust things, carpet and pad, maybe can affect lower frequencies. But for the most part, flooring and underlayments, their effects are limited to this frequency range. And so if we look at just that frequency range, we can better differentiate between different flooring and underlayment combinations. And a place where this can be particularly useful is um, for condos for HOA requirements that might be written into their CCNRs. Um, I've dealt a lot in the past with different HOAs um, where a condo owner wanted to oftentimes tear out carpet and put in hard surface flooring, right? And the HOA had some requirements in their CCNRs. Um, if you're going to replace flooring, right, you had to meet usually at some particular IIC criteria. And a number of times I ran into things where it was basically impossible to meet their IIC rating not because of the flooring and underlayment choices that the person was looking at, but because the structure itself wasn't enough to get to this higher IIC rating that the HOA wanted, unless basically you used carpet and pad. So it either forced you to use carpet and pad, um, or it was just a untenable or unreasonable stipulation, right? Um, HIIC is sort of or dependent on flooring and underlayment, so you can use it in that sort of a situation to specify flooring and underlayment um, and the stuff that the condo owners can affect and not the lower frequency stuff that they really can affect. Um, HIIC can also be used to evaluate um, ceiling isolators. LIIC 
is frequency range outside what we typically like measure and report for an IIC rating. So can't always be calculated from previous IIC test data. LIIC ratings are also rarely affected by flooring and underlayment. Like I said, flooring and underlayment tends to have the effects from like 400 hertz up. Again, some exceptions to that, but that's generally the case. So the LIIC can be uh, helpful for evaluating ceiling isolators and also just like structures. Um, but there are some caveats to the LIIC ratings that are very important to keep in mind if you start seeing these in literature and things like that. So LIICs can be hard to measure because the low frequency range. There's a bunch of physics that goes into that. I'll spare you that. But just know that, keep in mind, that LIIC ratings have lower accuracy and precision than do like IIC and HIIC ratings. There's also unknown and probably low correlation between labs. So if I take an assembly and measure it and get an LIC at this lab, and then I go build the same assembly at another lab, I might get a very different LIIC rating. And it's not necessarily because the two assemblies are performing totally differently, it's because there's differences in the labs. There's also unknown and probably low correlation between the lab and the field. So if I go to the lab, build an assembly, get an LIIC rating, and I go build the similar assembly in the field, the corresponding field rating might be very different from the lab rating. So you might be asking then, what on earth is the point of this rating? How is it useful? Um, where it's useful or best used right now is back-to-back -back comparisons of things in the same lab. Um, or, you know, tested in the same lab, but maybe a few months apart or something like that, where we control as many variables as possible, the lab environment being one of those variables. Um, and so if you see two assemblies, you see, you know, a difference between like this brand of resilient channel and this brand of resilient channel or resilient channel and clips or something like that, right? And you see a significant difference in the LIIC ratings when they're tested on the same assembly in the same lab. That's a good indicator that like, yeah, that makes a difference at low frequencies for impact sound. And um, we'll show some of those comparisons in just a minute. So methods of improvement. I think I'm getting uh, close on time here and we're just about done here. This is sort of the last section. So um, on all of these, I'm going to go through different ways that we can improve the performance of an assembly. Um, I've got two example assemblies here on the right. Um, the upper one is our base assembly. The lower one has sort of the modification, the addition to it. Um, so here we'll start with um, an open web truss. It's got three quarter inch gypsum concrete pour direct. Um, the one on top has no floor underlayment, and the one on the bottom has an engineered wood on a two millimeter rubber underlayment added to it, right? You can see the STC rating went down a point, not really significant. Flooring and underlayment tend to not affect STC ratings, but you can see the IIC and the HIIC ratings went up significantly. Um, you also see that the LIIC rating actually went down a few points. Now these are back to back comparisons, um, so that might be meaningful. A three point change is probably still sort of within like test variability. So maybe something, maybe not, but it least indicates that like the flooring and underlayment is not certainly not helping us at low frequencies and it might actually be hurting us a little bit. Um, so ceiling isolators. So here, um, similar assembly, right? Um, the difference is on the bottom, we have added an additional rubber isolator to the resilient channel to improve its performance. And again, SDC rating only goes up a point. Partly the limited changes in SDC ratings are here are due to lab limitations. Um, we'll save that for another conversation. But here we see that the IIC, the HIIC, and the LIIC ratings all went up. And in this case, the LIIC rating increased by six points. That's a big enough change to where I think it is, it is statistically significant, and it shows that these ceiling isolators are helping us both at high frequencies and low frequencies for impact sound. Another way that we can improve our sound isolation is just increasing the mass of whatever the assembly is, right? And if you think just very basically about the way sound passes through something, whether it's airborne or structure-borne sound, right? Um, we're basically cr causing the structure to vibrate, and then that vibrates the air on the receiving side of it, and that's kind of what we hear, right? Um, 
the heavier that thing is, the more energy it takes to vibrate at the same amount. Um, so if we increase the mass, we get less vibration, we get less sound transmission. So here we have a six inch concrete slab versus a 10 inch concrete slab. And you see that all of the ratings, the SDC, IIC, HIIC, and LIIC all go up and go up fairly significantly. However, there is a limitation to what we can get from increasing mass. So there's uh, what we call the mass law, and it basically says that uh, you double the mass, you get a six dB increase in theory, and your like noise reduction, right? So if we double the mass of something, we'll get about a six dB increase um, here. So if we went, you know, we see a four, five dB, you know, five point increases here. The LIC was actually more, but, um, you know, so uh, where we will typically do this is like if you think about a wall, right? So let's say um, we've got a, uh, you know, a typical uh, wall, sound isolation clips, two by fours, and a single layer of chip on each side, right? That might be like a, a 56. And if we double the mass on one side, we might get three or four points. So we might be at a 59, 60, something like that. And if you double the mass on the other side, we might get another three or four points. Um, and so we're, you know, at like a 62, something like that, right? So by doubling the mass on both sides, so doubling the total mass of the assembly, we get about six points. But to get another six points, you've got to double the mass again. So now you're going from two layers on each side to four. And to get another six points, you've got to double again. So now you're going from four to eight layers of chip, right? So you can see how using mass alone to increase your acoustical performance can pretty quickly become untenable, right? It requires too many layers, too much additional mass to get appreciable increases. So we have to look to other methods. Mass is just one of those things. Um, insulation is another way that we can get this. I'm not sure how easy it is to see on your screen, but the assembly on the top has no insulation in the truss cavity. Insulation or the assembly on the bottom has insulation in the truss cavity. And we can see that all of the ratings go up. Um, and again, that's pretty typical. If we add insulation to this cavity, we reduce the buildup of sound within that space. We're not blocking more sound with the insulation. If you just held out bad insulation, we could easily carry on a conversation through it without really any reduction in the sound. Um, but having the insulation in this cavity reduces the buildup of sound because it's basically like a re this reverberant space, right? Being in a room with all hard surfaces. Um, but again, with insulation, there are some limitations. If we have an assembly with no insulation and we add insulation to it, we tend to see big improvements in our STC and IIC ratings. Um, but as we continue to increase the insulation thickness, we'll see sort of incremental gains typically. Um, also keep in mind that like for floor ceiling assemblies, increasing your insulation thickness beyond a certain amount might require other changes to your assembly, like reducing the spacing of the resilient channels or hat channels and clips, which could actually degrade your acoustical performance. So there's some offsets there potentially. Last two things are stiffness and damping. I don't have examples for these because they can be more complicated. Um, stiffness especially, um, you know, again, we're looking at resistance to motion, resistance to vibrating of the assembly. Um, adding stiffness can help us sometimes, can hurt us sometimes, um, but it's certainly something to keep in mind, uh, both walls and floor ceiling assemblies, uh, but, you know, talk with a structural engineer and an acoustician to dig into something like that. Um, damping, there are like constrained layer damped gypsum board panels um, that can improve sound isolation. They're more effective for airborne sound isolation than for impact sound isolation. And they also tend to be most effective at mid and high frequencies, more that speech frequency range. They typically don't do as much for lower frequencies, um, especially the stuff sort of beyond the SDC rating, um, but they can be helpful. There's also all kinds of other damping methods like tuned mass dampers and things. I mean, I remember talking to an acoustical consultant that was working on a, a roller coaster on a cruise ship and they were using tuned mass dampers to reduce the vibration from the roller coaster that was going to get transmitted to the rest of the cruise ship. So again, those things can get complicated. Talk to an acoustician and, and dig into those if it's something you want to pursue for a project, but know it exists. 
So conclusion quickly here, code requirements, multifamily, SDC and IIC 50 for hospitals and classrooms and all kinds of other stuff. There are other codes or guidelines out there. SDC and IIC have their limitations. IIC limitations especially are significant because it ignores all this low frequency stuff that's important for just basic football noise. HIIC and LIC are good design tools. Um, ceiling isolation can improve both. Um, code requirements are minimums. And uh, here's the quote. So with that, we are close on time. We're basically there. Um, sorry, that went a little long today. So we'll open it to questions. Um, I do want to say that um, if you go check out our website, um, we have these assembly selectors. Um, you can go register. There's the link um, and you can get access to a bunch of different tested assemblies and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a good thing to go check out. And um, now I will go and open it up to any questions. Uh, Mike, I see you've got a hand. I can also just go and allow Mike for attendees. So if anybody wants to jump in and ask a question, go for it. Yeah, I just sorry, Mike, I just raised my hand to uh, let you know that there's a question that came through from Alan about uh, contour curves, curves, sorry, and how they're established. Ooh, the contour curves. Um, is that a quick answer? No, <laughs> I don't know. And it's actually something that we've been talking about in um, in ASTM, because there's this other thing, right, where I said like the maximum deficiency at any one octave band can exceed eight. That is also a fairly arbitrary thing that there's not a whole lot of like understanding or documentation of like where it came from. It's not there in the sort of similar European standards um, that I think sort of came first before the American like ASTM standards. Um, uh, but and the, that contour curve is similar, I think, between the European and the American standards. Sorry, I shouldn't say American. ASTM has got this whole thing. They're an international organization, too, but you know, whatever. Um, yeah, where those those contour curves came from, I don't know. There might be somebody else on here that um, does know, like if Norrell Stewart often joins these, if he's here, he would probably have some idea. But that's. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to do some digging and get back to that at some point. All right, thank you. I just uh, I'm, I work for Quiet Rock, so often when I'm doing my presentation, they they ask me that, and I don't have a good answer for it. <laughs> yeah, well, and you know, um, right? I was I knew your name sounded familiar, but I couldn't remember why. Um, the better person to ask actually is Ben Schaefer, yeah, because um, he's been. Um, you know, involved in ASTM a lot longer than I have, but he and I have had that conversation and I think he's gone back and done some like ASA and noise comp papers on like the history of the SDC standard. And I'm pretty sure in his investigations for that, he was like, yeah, I don't know where it came from. Um, yeah, I think he said it was pretty arbitrary and that's why the, the industry itself is trying to get together and establish, I guess, some sort of standards or understanding that would mean more. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Ben's Ben's working, and I'm working with him on um, a lot of things to establish better standards. We're also working on, um, uh, yeah. I'm actually getting uh, messages from the person I'm supposed to meet with here right now on um, a round robin for the ASTM E90, the standard that dictates the SDC measurements, um, on like. Uh, testing the exact same assembly at a bunch of labs to see sort of what the variability is between labs. Um, uh, All right, thank you. Oh, Tony, so Tony Hoover writes, um, I always thought the SDC curve intended to correspond to the mass law plus coincidence dip, but Bill Kavanaugh said it actually came very roughly from TL of face break. Interesting. That is okay. Yeah, because I always wondered if the dip actually played into that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I would trust whatever Bill Kavanaugh says for where it came from. So, um, yeah, interesting, Tony. Thanks for sharing. Feel free to unmute and jump in too. Um, I see another uh, question in here. 
Uh, thanks for sharing. How do people do the predictions or estimation? Um, the contour curve is the A weighting. If you refer to the reference curve. Um, I, maybe somewhat. I mean, maybe it's also somewhat based on like equal loudness contour curves. I don't I'm not sure, but um, not exactly sure what you mean by how do people do the predictions or estimation? I mean, if you're thinking about like predicting or estimating what a change to an assembly might do for the STC and IIC ratings, um, you know, if you can't just like add STC ratings or add a Delta IIC or something like that, right? So, um, you know, I'll do that a fair bit. I did it as a consultant, and now I do it for PAC. Um, and I'll do it in terms of third octave band, right? So I'll look at all of the measured data for two assemblies, and I'll see like, okay, if I added another layer of gypsum board to this assembly, not what did that do to the STC rating, but what did that do to the transmission loss at each third octave band? And that tends to be more consistent, though still not always. Um, but if you do it that way, you can get a better estimate. Um, and you know things like flooring and underlayment, right? If you've got a floor ceiling assembly and the IIC rating is controlled by the performance at low frequencies, which is often the case, right? Changing flooring and underlayment, which only affects mid and high frequencies, probably won't affect your IIC rating much or at all because it's not changing anything down at the low frequencies, which are controlling your IIC rating, right? So if we, um, if we look at the third octave band data, we can get a better estimate, but it's still a rough estimate oftentimes. Um, and sorry, let me respond to my other meeting person. Any other questions? Anybody want to? Uh, any other questions? Any want to pop on and add something or anything like that? Um, yeah, in the chat, there's a there's a link to our webinars. Um, and um, uh, somebody asked, I wasn't able to watch the recording of Surely You're Joking, um, which is a webinar I did last month, last week. No, last, last week. week. Goodness, last week on uh, shear walls and acoustical performance of shear walls. Um, so that is, I think, already loaded up on our website, right? On the webinars section. Yes, it's up. Is. It's up. Um, OK. Uh, and uh, I see David G says incorrect intervals between black and white keys. Yes, so in the piano keyboard that was wrong, there were three black keys on all of them. There should be alternating three and two, three and two. Just seeing who's paying attention. Um, anything else? Yeah, Alan, I'll say hi to Steve. He's uh, I think he's at AWCI. Normally he'd, he'd be here doing this with me, but I think he's otherwise occupied right now. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks, David. Glad to hear the presentation was easy to follow. Um, and there's a lot of technical information in there, so hopefully it it made sense to everyone. Um, yeah, any uh, anything else? We're already a little past the hour, so any any other questions before we wrap things up? Thanks, Tony. All right. Well, if that's the no more questions, um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, feel free to send an email um, or you know give us a call at PAC if you've got any other questions. And don't forget to go um, register for access to the assembly selectors if you don't already. There's a lot of great information in there, a lot of uh, good test data. Um, thanks, everybody. Have a great day.